If you're on a main street, you're going to find the main things that are happening. And unfortunately, a lot of it's really similar. You're seeing the same brands, the same stores, anywhere you go in the world. But if you go a block or two out of the way, the discovery of the really interesting thing happens. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to both founders of Cool Hunting, Josh Rubin and Evan Orenston. Cool Hunting is a beloved indie publication that is widely considered among creative professionals to be an indispensable resource for an informed preview of the future. In the 20 years that Cool Hunting has been around, Josh and Evan have been voyaging to the bleeding edge of technology, art, design, craft, and travel, interpreting what they find within the larger context, and bringing back their discoveries curated, distilled, artfully packaged, and fully translated to the readers of Cool Hunting. In addition to the award-winning publication, they also operate a strategic consultancy, branded content studio, hosted travel service, and experimental retail program. And now, also a podcast. It's called Design Tangents and features Josh and Evan in conversation with all manner of cultural luminaries from artists and designers to musicians and tech pioneers. The founding of Cool Hunting plays out like a serendipitous chemical reaction that, in hindsight, is suspiciously obvious. Like, maybe Kismet is the cover for what actually is a cute ESP? I don't know, you decide. But the way they navigate spontaneity is deft and precise, like they know what's coming before it gets here. Partners in life and in work, they have a chemistry that will warm your ears. And before all of this, each of them had vibrant and formative professional lives. So when you hear the backstories, everything will start to add up and it will be as clear as the view through a cosmic telescope why everything they do is infused with their profoundly worldly perspective and deep, reverent, otherworldly love for each other and for the future. Here's Josh and Evan. My name is Evan Ornston. I'm the co-founder of Cool Hunting. I live in Beacon, but I'm a citizen of the world. My name is Josh Rubin. I, along with Evan, am the co-founder of Cool Hunting. Evan and I are married. We like to tell people right away because sometimes they pick up a dynamic between us and they don't know what to make of it. So yeah, I also live in Beacon and am also a citizen of the world. I want to go back to the beginning of both of you. Can you each tell me a little bit about where you grew up, how you found your way through teenage years and to school? So I was born in Vermont. My parents were both from New York and left for Vermont to find a a simpler, happier life in nature. And they had opened a couple ski shops. And that was kind of the the family business when I was born. Mm. But I was I was like three or four when they divorced. And my mother moved down to Miami and my father stayed in Vermont. And until I was eight years old, I spent half the year in Vermont and half the year in Miami. And then when I was eight, they married each other again. And we lived in Miami. And that did not work very well. In less than a year, they were divorced again. But from that point forward, I was in Miami. And I left Miami when I was done with high school, and I'll I'll catch up to that in a minute. But Evan likes to joke that this back and forth between Vermont and Miami is the foundation of my life of contrasts. And the reason why I have so many tattoos and, (laughs) you know, kind of attributes to my Psychological uniqueness, we could call it. (laughs) But the other thing that I've realized somewhat recently is that my creative output, my first creative output was photography. Okay. I started taking pictures when I was eight years old and developing them, developing the film, printing them in the dark room, started doing that at at very young and continued through junior high and high school, which was, which was great because then there were dark rooms in school. And Then when I got to college and was continuing with photography, Photoshop came out and I started scanning and manipulating images. And I became really critical of the interface of Photoshop. And that led me down the path of studying cognitive science and 
ultimately becoming an interaction designer. So my first and earliest work was as an interaction designer, which now is thought of more as, I guess, UX. But I think going back and forth between Vermont and Miami and going back and forth between different schools, I had a chance to see how people perceive things in unique ways and how education can be different and how the environment that you're in influences your perception of so much. And those were sort of the seedlings that turned into my critical opinions about how we interact with things or how I think we should interact with things. All right, Evan, I would love to hear your background. I grew up in Minneapolis. I have enormous affection for the city and I loved growing up there. I feel like I had a really incredible childhood. It was a time of really exciting things, different kinds of educational styles happening. Um, I went to a school that had like open classrooms and modular classes and it was, you know, public school, but you you went to whatever level you were in. So if you were ahead in math, you might be with people a year or two ahead of you. Um, and if you were in reading and you were the same as everyone else that was your age, then you'd be with kind of those people. So it was this really amazing progressive thing. And it was, I, I'm enjoying this moment on Instagram when there are people who are of my generation sharing how we grew up without technology <laughs> with absolute freedom, with parents who didn't really care. They were like, come back for dinner, hopefully. You know, there was no checking in. There was no safe spaces. There was none of this sensitivity about feelings or anything. It was just, <laughs> it was just a very different era, and we were untethered. So just to clarify, what generation do you count yourself among? I'm a Gen Xer near the beginning of the uh, Gen X spectrum. Oh, man. So you were there for Prince and the replacements and Husker Du and everything. Ugh. Yeah, the live music scene in Minneapolis was epic, epic, epic. When I was beginning high school, was the very beginning of Prince's breaking out from just being a local music star. And um, I want to have heart palpitations. Okay, keep telling. So he played at a uh, prom. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> Pre, you know, this was before his first album, Prince, came out. It was pretty major. What? Yeah. Well, I'm a Gen Xer too, but we just had a shitty DJ for our prom. So, <laughs> like, the idea of Prince performing is something I can't yeah, even. Yeah, but you, you know, you have to go back to a time and place when he was in a certain circle of people who liked live music in Minneapolis, a smaller town, before there was internet and stuff. Like, if you weren't on the radio, no one knew who you were. Right. So, it was a very different era. So, he was. You know, not a celebrity. But did he play like a set of R and B covers, or was it no, like original? Always was original. He playing all the instruments. Always original. No, there was a band. You know, a small band. My sister actually went to school with a lot of the people who were in that band, and later were part of that uh, world. The stylists, the musicians. Yeah, the whole mini scene. So she's a few years older than me, and um, yeah, was was part of all that. So I don't know. Minneapolis. I, I have mostly incredibly fond memories. I knew. I think by the time I was in kindergarten, I recognized that I was not like the others around me. And I think a couple layers to that. I think one, I was Jewish, uh, went to a school that wasn't heavily Jewish in a neighborhood that wasn't particularly Jewish. I, I had no idea what gay was mm -hmm. or what sexuality was, but I knew that I was kind of, I felt different than the people around me. And that definitely played a part of my being this outsider or other person. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I understood from a very, very early age that I was gay, but I didn't really know what that meant or process it for many years later. And part of it really is around, I would say, curiosity. I, I'm a person driven by curiosity. And I found that a lot of the people around me, friends, family, students, I felt weren't as curious as I was. Mm-hmm. I know that feeling. It's kind of a trap. And for me, it just felt like this wasn't my place or my time. And and yeah. I think a fourth layer was something I've I've learned much more recently in getting in touch with my own energy and my 
connection to what I would say are past experiences or past lives. And I feel like I just, I had the most curiosity about traveling from the very earliest age. And that has always been something that's fueled me. Part mm -hmm. of that is my Sagittarian nature, I think. But part of it is just this kind of insatiable curiosity to see other places and people and hear other languages. I had a pretty natural affinity for languages. I took German in elementary school, eventually French in, in middle school, and went on to college where I studied language. So I left Minneapolis and I went to Vassar. I don't know if you want to talk about the meeting and getting together, but I love to hear the origin story of a love story. Yeah. <laughs> so for undergraduate, I went to Hampshire College in Western mm -hmm. Mass. Super fun, funky, creative, weirdo, challenging school. No tests, no grades, no core, no majors. And then for graduate school, I, I moved to New York and went to NYU to the Interactive Telecommunications Program. Nice. And when I was finishing up at ITP and starting to look for a job, a friend of mine said, oh, well, I'd love to introduce you to my friend, Evan. He is one of the guys that kind of helped start Razorfish. And at the time, Razorfish was like the hottest of digital design firms. And this was 1999. So still very early days. Razorfish was helping companies figure out their very first web strategies and build their very first web experiences. Pretty groundbreaking, super interesting stuff. And of course, I wanted to go in and Evan, Evan can kind of tell his side of this story as well. But, I, but when I showed up to meet him, it was, it was a love at first sight moment. And I'd moved to New York for grad school. And I spent that first year when I wasn't in school trying to find a relationship. And that doesn't work so well in New York. So then my second year was just enjoying being single. And I was very happily single, was not looking, walked into Evan's office. I was like, oh, wow, like, wait, he's the one and why now and all that kind of stuff. And we had about a six week period of getting together a little bit here and there to talk about work. Mm -hmm. And then he invited another person to join us at dinner one night. It's like, oh, this guy works with me. He's also single. Maybe you guys want to date, all that kind of stuff. I'm oh. like, wait, what's going on here? Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna roll with this. Okay. See how this plays through. That friend, um, whose name is Nick, is still one of our closest friends. We totally hit it off that night. But after dinner that night, I needed to clarify a couple things with Evan. <laughs> and we've basically been together ever since. Um, there's more <laughs> to the story, though, which is, which is worth telling. And I'm going to hand that over to Evan. After Vassar, I thought I would go to Japan. But I ended up going to Paris. Actually, suburban Paris, technically. I wanted to get an MBA. I felt like I, I needed to do that right away, if I went into the world and worked as everyone else did before they got their MBA, I felt like I would never go back to school. And I had the opportunity to go to the first business school in the world created by Napoleon um, in France called Les Autitudes Commerciales. And I won't go in deep into that story other than that they were starting a new major in international business. And I, of course, wanted to study international business. And in the US in that era, there really wasn't a focus on that. And if there were, that was mostly taught by American professors. And I felt like, well, how can you have a really international experience if you are being taught by other Americans? And yeah, they have experiences, but it's not the same as being with foreign students. So I went from you know, having an incredibly active and engaged community and social life in a pretty small-sized college to moving to suburban Paris. And other students were literally from every other continent and very interesting international mix. So that to me was all very, very powerful. And I was so happy in France. I loved France. I loved you know, going to the market one morning and all of a sudden it's apple season and there's 18 varieties of apples. And I'd never seen that before. I'd seen like four apples, you know? I was like, there's <laughs> right. a red apple, a green apple, you know? <laughs> I had no idea. And when I went to work, like the water cooler conversation was like, did you, did you go to the market this morning? Did, did you see those apples? Like, what did you get? 
and it was like an incredibly deep conversation about the importance of variety and and provenance and you know what I grew up with and my grandmother made this kind of tart and my mom made this and you know I had learned how to make that like that that was another big moment of mine and um I went back to Vassar for my fifth college reunion it was 1993 and I was in New York and the the talk was about technology and about how the internet was evolving and how the web was kind of percolating it didn't really exist so much and certainly not in the way in which we know it today and mm -hmm. this was something that was so big that was so immense such a major force that was going to change the world and i took that back with me to france and i started having conversations with where i worked and also with other places that i was interviewing and i was like this is really going to be the future and you know the response was you know france had done something miraculous in creating the minitel and the Minitel was a text-only, basically, web device that they gave to everyone in France. Every home got a Minitel if you wanted one. And most of them had like a green screen, and it was very small. And it basically was a text web. And it had a digitized phone book. It had train schedules and plane schedules. It had, uh, and all this was free to anyone in France. And then it had paid services like dating and horoscopes like and sports things, like the exact same things that we still have, right? Uh -huh. But they did it all first in a text-only way. And they were really resistant to this notion that it could be bigger than that. Oh. And I was like, no, I'm telling you, this is like major. And at the time, I was so interested in branding and brand identity and things like that. And as if you are familiar with that world, you'd have a brand handbook or guidebook that was this massive printed thing that was crazy expensive to create. And then, of course, the minute you print it, it's outdated. And then every year you have to have an update and print it and ship it to all these other, you know, whoever's involved in creating works with that brand. And I was like, for example, we could digitize that. And I just felt this unease. And I was at this life, this critical life conjecture point of, do I stay where I feel so complete and happy and peaceful and in love, like I just loved France. I loved Paris. But I also felt like the future was not going to happen there for me. And the future was going to happen in New York. This decision between staying where you feel good to going where you feel like the future's happening, that's a tough one. It, it, it's rare that a month goes by where Evan doesn't suggest <laughs> that we move back to Paris. <laughs> He's really? still, it's, it's well, still, it will, it will happen. I yeah. imagine at some point I've been working on it and I'll get back to how Paris plays a role in our life. So I, I moved back to New York. I reconnect with two of my best childhood friends and we're all kind of figuring out how do we work in this world of technology. And there was another kind of conjecture point that happened a little bit later. Um, it was just the three of us who were working together and I had this kind of dream opportunity where I was like, it, I'm loving this being with my friends, but I also, we weren't just sure what to do and we weren't sure how our individual responsibilities could manifest properly in this nascent company, if you will, that we had started. And I had an opportunity to go to a very highly respected old school corporate identity firm called Siegel and & Gale. And um, long story short, I went there, was always in touch with Jeff and Craig and it was about two years later, so 1995 or so, that I went back and went to what became Razorfish. And I was the 10th person there and helped grow that company f over many years, taking it public, growing to about 2,800 employees is, is pretty major. Yeah. And so here I am, you know, and I'm single for the first time and I am have achieved a certain level of very early success and one of my closest friends said, hey, there's this really hot guy that I hang out with at the coffee shop. And it's been months that we've been flirting. We finally talked. And he was really interested in Razorfish. Um, he's just graduating. And why you, would you be interested in, he didn't even say that. He said, would you do me a favor and just have like an informational interview? And his name is Lynn. And I was like, Lynn, come on. Like, I'm so busy. I'm hardly ever in New York. My job by that point was basically um, running our whole international organization. 
I lived on an airplane. I was in New York maybe five or seven days a month. But I was like, for you, of course, anything. And I will kind of reconnect to where Josh said, you know, like he walked into my office. I had a glass office. And um, here's this like incredibly beautiful human that walked into my office. And we, we, our eyes locked. And it was one of those like movie scene moments where a lifetime flashes ahead of you. Like you just see stuff that is so intense. And I think while we probably weren't aware of it, then like our energy just was like, wow, what the fuck is going on? Like this is, I'd never felt that before. And there was not just an attraction, but a connection that I don't think either of us understood, but we felt was manifested in that moment. So to jump ahead to those six weeks, we finally had that weekend together. We made out for the first time, maybe a little bit more. And um, the next day I was going back to Europe. I was at that moment running one of the Razorfish offices in Hamburg in Germany. And I had to go back to Europe the next day. And, and Josh, I knew was graduating and was kind of free. And I was like, hey, I'm a bit of a baller. Like, what are you doing <laughs> next weekend? Why don't we celebrate your graduation in Paris? Damn. So we met in Paris and we were supposed to be there for two or three days. It ended up being about five days. And that last day we were in a taxi on our way to the airport and we had this very deep conversation about not wanting that connection to end. And we decided that we would date exclusively on that date, uh, which was May 8th. And subsequently, that is the date we use as our anniversary. Mm -hmm. Next year will be our, in 2024, will be our 25th anniversary. And um, it feels just like a moment, like a, a blip, but this journey that we've had together. That's the most beautiful story. Yeah. And we got I married twice yeah. subsequently <laughs> on that date. So first time, first time in Canada, because we couldn't in the States. Um, but that was on May 8th. And then the second time in New York, once New York passed and, and we could do it in New York. This all makes me so happy. Do oh. you feel like your connection is karmic on some level? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I know. Absolutely. I could feel it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And meanwhile, you know, while I met Evan with the interest in potentially working at Razorfish, I then had subsequent interviews at Razorfish with other people and was pursuing other jobs. You know, fast forward to this incredible weekend in Paris where we decide, okay, this is like, this is it. We, we want to figure out how to make this work. I got home from Paris in New York City to a message on my answering machine because we still had those then. And it was a job offer from IDO. And IDO was my first choice. Actually, Razorfish was my second choice. So I, I had this offer from IDO to move to San Francisco and start as an intern, sort of as a try before you buy kind of program in a San Francisco studio, focusing on bringing digital to the practice. Because for the most part, IDO was just focused on physical design at that time. And I then moved to San Francisco. Evan is mostly based in Germany. We have this, you know, incredible summer of love connection, you know, like a passion, love story going on. And we're separated by a very far distance. Somehow we managed to get together almost every weekend in different cities around the world. You know, we were, we were traveling together really from the outset. And uh, sidebar, when we talk to any of our friends who are in some early stage of a developing relationship and they're questioning it, the easy, quick advice is travel together. Just get on a plane, get on a train, get in a car, go somewhere, stay in a hotel, stay in, you know, stay somewhere else and be someplace new together and see how it all works. It becomes very clear whether or not you're compatible in that kind of environment. So clearly you two are compatible, but in what ways do you complement each other? Are you both spontaneous or is one a little bit more like a loose plan and the other one's winging it? And also bring this into your work life as well. I'm, I'm interested in how you complement each other. 
I am more of a planner. I am a bit more rigid. Evan is more fluid and more of a, you know, more inclined to wing it. Where we come together with a lot of things is, you know, if we're traveling or we're visiting someplace new or, or what have you, a few key destinations or restaurants or meetings or, you know, most importantly, people on the schedule ahead of time and leaving room for discovery as well. Part of it kind of came into one kind of recurring editorial format that we have for travel content that we create is called word of mouth. And it really is about that. It's having having a couple starting points. And then based on the experience you have there or the people you talk to there, finding out about other things to see and do in that destination. So I think in terms of travel, that's how we come together. In terms of work and a lot of other aspects of life, in general, Evan says yes, and I say no. <laughs> and I have learned to say yes a lot. And Evan's getting much better at saying no. But, you know, Evan is very optimistic about being able to do a million things in a day, about whatever the project or the plan is, it's, it's always going to work. And I'm a bit more pragmatic. You know, there's a beauty to that optimism. Yeah. And I see that beauty and I love that beauty. And I get frustrated with it at times. <laughs> and I think, you know, an, another thing that we do that's kind of an extension of cool hunting is we organize and host travel experiences. We travel so often for what we do. We realize that we could create, you know, an extension of the business where people get to come along for the ride instead of waiting for the story. I was reading about that. It sounds magical. The trips are great. When we plan those trips, Evan usually is leading that charge and he will have an initial itinerary that is uh, just untenable. It's just, it, they're just, it's, it's, it, it is the, the pinnacle of optimism. He has a million things. There's no consideration for how much time it's going to take to get between A and B, all of this stuff. And people need to rest that they're on vacation. The that people need to rest, that people don't have the stamina that we have. We're, we, we travel a lot. We do a lot. We go from thing to thing to thing and we have stamina for it. And that's where I have to come in and, you know, and really kind of edit so that people are not just flat on the floor by the end of it. I like that you're really approaching this with a storytelling and curator's perspective. And just the fact that we experience the world in an unbelievably beautiful and privileged way. We've been doing this work for 20 years, have such an incredible network across so many categories. We just know a lot of people and, and we have these incredible opportunities to experience things in a manner, like everyone maybe can go to a museum and see the new show. We tend to see that before it opens to the public. We're usually there if the artist is alive, the artist is there talking about their work, the curator, someone else from the museum is there. That's kind of what we're used to. We're always incredibly aware that it is a blessing and a privilege, and um, it is not a right, it is not given, you know? And it's in exchange for, of course, hopefully writing about it and sharing that with other people. And even though we don't write about everything, we certainly share it, you know, personally at least, or on social with everybody. So it's it's something we never take for granted. And when we're having these unbelievable experiences, and we could go on and on about even just the last couple months of things, amazing things that we've done, we want to be able to share that. And so one way of sharing that is through our content on cool hunting. Mm -hmm. And another is, as Josh said, it's bringing people along for the ride. And instead of writing the story and having them read it, it's having them be there to kind of write their own story, if you will. Just... One bridge before we talk about the present, Evan, because we talked about Razorfish and IDO and and you know and all this stuff career wise, my time at IDO did not last long before I realized Razorfish was the better place for me. So I bounced over to Razorfish, moved back to New York. Evan also moved back to New York, and we immediately moved in together from this long distance relationship. And we were both at Razorfish, not working on the same projects, but at the same company, and we had developed this blurry line between life and work. And ultimately at Razorfish, I was running our wireless and mobile practice. And then I was recruited by Motorola to build a user interface, user experience team at a point where phone screens were becoming bigger. 
and then back to grad school, my graduate work in 99 was um, looking at the design of panning and zooming interfaces on touchscreen devices. Oh, wow. So that was becoming more and more relevant. And we both left Razorfish in the summer of 2001. And we ended up moving to Chicago so that Josh could have this experience at Motorola. And I was in a position where I didn't have to get a job right away. And I was just trying to feel out Chicago and what that could mean for us and what the opportunities would be. And having lots of interviews, we decided to get a house there. And that was a big project. So I was working on that. And um, we had one friend in Chicago, which is kind of funny, only one. And she had left New York the week earlier to go be Oprah's chief of staff. And she said, why don't you just come and hang out? And there's some amazing people here. You should just meet them. And maybe something will happen, maybe not, but you'll meet some great people and make some friends. And you know, long story short, I went from being this tech entrepreneur in a very senior role at what became a public company to making breakfast for Oprah and Stedman on occasion. And- <laughs> Oh my God, both of your lives are just so incredible. <laughs> so we would come home and I would share my experience of the day and the things that I found that I was super excited about. And sometimes those were things like okra pickles or ice cream or this new rice cooker. And Josh would come home and say, oh, I just found this amazing thing that I think is gonna be really helpful as I think about how to create an interface. These were the world's first like touchscreen phones that were designed exclusively for the Chinese market. And, you know, he had all these incredible technology things. So we we found our conversation at night to be really great. And Josh was like, but I really just need a couple minutes. I have to like journal this, basically. Well, I wanted to catalog this stuff. You know, we were we, we were having all these great conversations about our our different discoveries, and I wanted a way to keep track of it. You know, in earlier days, we would rip pages out of magazines and file them and, you know, put together scrapbooks and had all these physical references. And I wanted to build some sort of digital reference. So I downloaded blogging software, put it on my server, customized the templates, and started using that as a way to keep track of all these things that we were discovering and that we were excited about. To be fair, it was really things you were discovering. And it was very short into this process of a couple months where we'd come home and I'd be like, I want to talk to you. Stop using your computer. <laughs> like, stop and let's talk. <laughs> um, and I, I just said, this is something that is either going to bring us together even more so, or it's going to drive us apart. So let's try doing it together. And that's really how our adventure in this started, was having this collaborative journal and, and online resource or reference library that honestly was just meant for us. It just happened to be, because of using blogging software, it just happened to be available to other people. And it developed an audience. It was, you know, this was, this was a time when, you know, th there were only a few design magazines that were out there. A lot of people were subscribed to all of them. They'd receive mm -hmm. their issue, devour it over the course of a weekend, and then have to wait a month for more. And they were starting to look online for more regular sources of inspiration about design or tech or, you know, I mean, we were all over the place. It was food and cars and travel. And so that was the, that was the initial audience. So this is 2003. Yeah. Yes? This was 2003. In Chicago. Yeah. Born in our kitchen in February of 2003. By the fall of 2003, we were already back in New York. I don't know what I imagined, <laughs> but I imagined it was maybe a little more calculated than that. No. This is so organic. It was just something we did. And we had these very big moments. You know, we came back and it was, we both got different jobs when we moved back to New York. We were still doing this on the side and we realized that Josh would be better just being independent and not working at a, at a company. So he started doing that. And then we realized that we were in a position where we could have an intern. And then that intern became our first editor and then, you know, subsequently an editor in chief. Things were starting to move in that world, but we both had other jobs, you know, and cool was definitely our side hustle. And all of a sudden, you know, we were starting a new company together, a new tech company, which we did with a lot of our former colleagues from Razorfish. 
And we integrated those two things. So not integrated, but we shared an office space, I should say. So we had a separate team of people that were working on cool hunting who had nothing to do with the consulting side. Um, but that was how we earned a living was through the consulting business. We had some super fun and fulfilling projects. And a lot of them were tied to helping different publications figure out their online strategy. They were seeing what we were doing with cool hunting. And they were at a point where they were taking whatever was in print and putting it on their website. Mm. And they were just realizing that there was room to make content that would only exist online and to do that on a much more regular basis, but they didn't really know how to do it. So we were helping to redesign their websites, figure out the content strategy, work through what the team makeup should be, uh, editorial workflow, all of that kind of stuff, because we had we had figured it out for ourselves with Cool Hunting. So it became part of the a big part of the practice for the design firm that we started. That makes sense. It was very fun and satisfying for a while until the market dipped and all of a sudden it was insurance and pharma were the only industries that were hiring for our services. And meanwhile, the, you know, cool hunting had a small team. They were off doing incredible things. Yeah. I remember one pivotal moment, Josh, we were working on a pharma website and we had a vacation planned and we were sitting down, you know, with the cool hunting team and we're like, so what are you up to? And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to Italy. I'm going to go to Ferrari and they want to share all these, you know, things with us. And the other person, I don't remember where they were going, but the team is like repeating what they're doing. And Josh and I were like, fuck, we just canceled our vacation to work on this pharma website for the next week. And as Josh said, it was this downturn in the economy. And so this is, I think, 2007, where we realized two things that had happened. One, we were ready to commit full time to cool hunting. And importantly, you know, again, this is still such early days in the media landscape. We felt like there was an opportunity where we could actually earn a living by doing cool hunting alone and no longer needing to subsidize it by having a quote normal job or day job. And that was a really big deal. And, you know, I think the first advice we gave was travel with someone that you're interested in dating or partnering with. Um, second, I would say is take advantage of downturns. So an economic downturn provides a huge opportunity and pivotal things have happened to us where we've seized those moments to reposition our business and the way we work and the kind of work we want to do. And that was one of them. And it was a really good move and it was good timing because the market was still very immature in the digital media space, but it was mature enough where there was enough happening that it it worked for us. So that resulted in you shaving off this aspect of your work that was no longer satisfying and leaning more into the cool hunting 100%. piece of it and, and cool hunting being the bread and butter. Absolutely. But you still do strategy consulting, but now it's through the cool hunting lens. So you're only doing the kinds of projects you want to do. Exactly. Y'all, I'm taking notes. You're living life yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cool hunting is really the, the backbone for all mm -hmm. of the different ways that our business extends. So on the consulting side, we're really taking advantage of the access and the insight that we have because of cool hunting to help clients with a lot of it is, is trend and futuring work. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of design strategy. Product development do a mm -hmm. fair amount of product development. We put together partnerships and collaborations. And there is, you know, also a bunch of studio work helping certain clients tell their story through short films and photos and narrative. And it is definitely an extension of cool hunting. And it is different. It's very different, you know, being at other design firms in the past. Yeah. I, I think what's interesting is we have, there's, there's two things. We're not people who go out and and talk about ourselves. We There's actually, in 20 years, not that much press about us or about cool hunting from our point of view. We're very much behind the scenes people and, and we're observers more than we are out there hustling. Um, lesson number three, and this ties to, we, Amy, we were having a little pre-conversation to talking about your work at RISD and, and students and, and how it would be great to share with them like how important it is to communicate and share your work with a bigger audience early on. 
And we've really learned that we have to find this way. And we've not honestly been very good at it. We, are, we don't hustle. We don't talk about ourselves in that way. But having this podcast, which debuted earlier in, in 2023, has given us this opportunity to kind of reflect a little bit about our journey, both personally and professionally, and about cool hunting. And what we've come to understand is that our 20 years of experience diving in and out of so many different communities, the technology community, the fashion community, the art community, the architecture and design community, the furniture world, automobiles, food, travel, all these things that that inform us, what we realized is that we're kind of unicorns and our relationships are so deep over two decades in so many different worlds that we bridge these multiple worlds simultaneously. And in fact, we realized that we were in a position that we could be additive to those companies and to those teams. We can come in and, and introduce them to things that were happening and potential partners, as Josh said. We could help lay a strategy based on our very unique purview of the world, both geographically and through different industries. Yeah. And that's honestly like what we do. And it's incredibly hard to market that <laughs> and communicate that as like, hey, we're unicorns. We're just weird. We know a lot about a lot of things. And none of your people that you're working with have the same life experience as we have or work experience. And that's what we bring. I totally understand, A, how important that is and what an amazing sort of melange of insight that you can bring to a situation because most people don't even know they need a unicorn like you. They think they need a one thing, so they go shop for that thing they think they need. But what they really need is somebody to help them zoom out and see how it might connect to something else and where it lives in the larger context. And yes, I can see that you two are like your solid gold when it comes to that. <laughs> I, this leading me to, I think this is our third or fourth big observation. And that's, you know, while there is a lot of glamour to what we do, there, it's also exhausting <laughs> frequently and um, yeah. many things. But it's also a lot of trade shows, a lot, a lot, a lot of really unglamorous trade shows in Vegas and other places. And something we observed along the way was in between our appointments with the really obvious big players. That if you go to the part of the trade show that's low budget, which typically is the, the outskirts, perimeters. the perimeters, there's no branding, there's no PR person, that the discovery of the really interesting thing happens. And that for us has been so important that a lot of our coverage of those kinds of things, whether it's CES, for example, is, mm -hmm. of course, we're going to talk about what some of the big players are doing, but here's all these things we discovered that you know, truly was a discovery for us and that we can really share with our audience. And I think it's one of the hallmarks of cool hunting is kind of being obscure and and not just regurgitating press releases from all these known brands, but bringing in what lesser known creators, designers, makers, entrepreneurs are doing and giving them a spotlight. So it's, you know, it's harder work because the messaging isn't there. You have to kind of make the story. You have to observe it and you be like- to be kind of a detective. Yeah. yeah. Like what are they doing and how does it fit in? Again, there's no almost always like no marketing materials or even great brand messaging. And you have to kind of put those things together and be like, actually, what this group is doing is super interesting and what they're working on should be shared. I think about the explorers who needed to trust themselves enough to go into uncharted territory. And then they needed to tell people what's happening in this uncharted territory to people who don't have a frame of reference. And I feel like that's what you two are doing so much because you're out there on the edges of what's happening. And it's kind of your job to decide what has merit, what feels like it's going to connect. And then you need to spin it into something that other people can understand who don't yet have a frame of reference for it. That's a powerful skill. That's a really powerful skill. I, I think everyone has this opportunity and, you know, you can start with, if you are regularly going to work or to school or whatever, just take a different route. 
Or maybe you take a different mode of transportation. If you always take the bus or the subway, maybe you walk, maybe you ride a bike, maybe you're in a car or whatever. Give yourself the opportunity to experience something new and different. Even if you're just going on a, you know, one block out of the way, it's a different experience on your way to where you're going. And when you travel, feel that you have the ability to not do the obvious thing and go down the main street. Meander, right? And find uh, your way through side streets. It's the same construct as a trade show, right? If you're on a main street, you're going to find the main things that are happening. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, a lot of it's really similar. You're seeing the same brands, the same stores, anywhere you go in the world. But if you go a block or two out of the way, that's when you're going to see stuff that's probably only really local. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest thing to experience today for us when we're trying to discover someplace new. So take the opportunity to find those lesser known things and to just not shock your your sense of discovery, but to just kind of poke it a little bit and say like, I can do this even on my commute that I've done a million times from here to there. If I just went out of the way or took five more minutes to drive a different way or whatever it is, take a different bus line, that is going to expose you to new things and kind of provoke you to be open to them, hopefully. I was going to ask you, as you travel the world and you see the homogenization of, you know, everything, everything, what is it that stands out as being resistant to that? Craft. Craft is still something yes. that is yes. so important to us and, and a big backbone for cool hunting. And it, it is thriving in, in few places and supported in few places. Cuba is one of those places where the government is behind training people to learn craft and trades. Morocco is another where mm. you can go to incredible schools if you are talented and you can learn how to do ceramics or metalwork or woodwork or you know tile or iron if you show some promise. And because those are such important parts of those economies in those countries and for tourism and all these other things, they're supported and, and, and recognized. And if you compare that to places like Japan, where you're dealing with just a lack of uh, maybe interest in some products, so kimono is a good example of that. And you go to these places where maybe there used to be five or 10 or 20 families doing that. And literally 20 years later, there's three, right? So you see the contraction of traditional craft in so many cultures. And we have tried to go in and celebrate that. We worked on a project for Ferrari where they asked us to work with their customization team to really push them and to show what could be done if you had a very unique vision for a car. So one of the highlights of that was that we brought in several Japanese artisans to create that. And I'll just say that the interior of this car was made from 75-year-old vintage upcycled kimono by using a fabric that is traditionally used for more utilitarian uses. And we brought that into the interior of a performance and luxury vehicle and showed the world that you could celebrate craft and adapt it to different kinds of uses and, and surprise and delight people through that. And also... You know, that fabric is called Sakiori. It's an ancient method of upcycling, basically. And the opportunity to show the fans of Ferrari and the followers of Ferrari that something that is upcycled can be luxurious yeah, was really meaningful to us. It's not even upcycling at this point. It's archiving. Yeah, <laughs> and, and sharing it. And I... You know, I tell this story all the time, and I, it always brings tear to my eyes. At the at the debut of this car, it was in New York for Design Week last year, and several of the artisans came for that big unveiling, and they hadn't seen the car. The car was done during the pandemic, so there was no travel. It was all these conference calls and DHLing stuff all over the world. So the artisan who wove this fabric lives on a very small island called Amami Oshima, which is near Okinawa in the southwest archipelago of Japan, and someone who struggled to you know, continue his family's business as weavers and who has taken Sakiori as one direction to create new things, new products that they could sell. And I, I said, Hajime, I'm gonna, I want you to close your eyes and I'm going to walk you to the car 
and when we get to the car, I'm going to open the door and, I, and then you can open your eyes. And I open the door, he takes his hands away and he just, just the tears start coming down his face. This kind of disbelief that his humble craft, as he would say, was used in such an unimaginable way, like no one would ever think to put it in a car. And it, it is beautiful on its own, but to see his face and to be able to honor him and his work, he spent three months weaving that fabric that was used on the inside of the car. So like the, the levels of storytelling are just so amazing. You can see all about that, lots of videos and, and photos at ferrari.coolhunting.com great storytelling but it for us was was more than that it was like amazing to work with ferrari but it was also such an honor to celebrate the work of so many different craftspeople in japan and show the world and especially those in japan that maybe you don't want to grow up and be a tiktoker or a footballer maybe you do want to continue in your family's business of craft or maybe you're inspired on your own to be an apprentice or to learn that and to find that there is honor and opportunity and excitement in traditional craft. And there is a way to sometimes evolve it. That is such an incredible story. And I love it on all the levels, but I also love just the juxtaposition of a slick, high-tech automotive with this deeply handmade tactile piece of craft is a very unexpected combination. Three months of somebody's skilled craft labor into the space, it makes it so much more special. You're saying to the world, don't forget craft. Yeah, we we love using contrast as a way to introduce people to new ideas and change their perspective on 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 various things. And with this project, as you've just said, it was very much about the contrast between a high performance, very high tech sports car and very analog ancient craft. It also was about a dialogue between Japan and Italy. So one of yeah. the one of the big pieces of the project was this idea of creating a bit of a love story between Japan and Italy where there are so many similarities in the intended output. There's an attention to detail and a passion for the final product. And the process of getting there is so different culturally. And, you know, it was really a big challenge and a huge learning opportunity and ultimately super interesting to navigate the back and forth between Japan and Italy. And so the headliner of the car is leather. And we worked with an indigo dyer in Kyoto who works with natural indigo. And so he did the, he did the leather dyeing and then the leather was sent to Italy where it was cut and woven in a very traditional Italian style to make this woven leather headliner of the car. And we also really love and appreciate the poetry of that headliner not being visible to anyone outside of the car. It is there for the driver and the passenger and that's it. And it's this special moment and this, you know, again, contrast or this reminder about craft and handwork and attention to detail while also experiencing something which is very much of the moment and moving into the future. I love that. I very much interpret your looking to the future as being about evolving. I think we're going through a big transition in our lives um, and in cool hunting. You know, we're 20 years old. You know, we, we know we're on the verge of another really, really big reset. The things that are happening around us, AI is one of many things. Um, the way we're working is changing. And, and most importantly, you know, the way that people consume media is constantly changing, right? If you think back to a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, most of the platforms we used didn't exist. A lot of the tools that we use today didn't exist. 
um, and the way that we consume information has radically changed. So as we approached our 20th anniversary, we were like, we're going to do a book. We're going to do an installation. We're going to do all these things. We're going to celebrate everything we've accomplished. And the more we dug into all those things during the pandemic, we were like, who gives a shit? Like, if we do an exhibit, I want it to be 5%, here's what we've done, and here's 95% about where we think the world is going or what's interesting or commissioning work from artists or whoever. It, it's about the future. We obviously think about what have we done, how have we done this, what can we learn from that process? But we are very future-focused. So our history is important, especially establishing who we are and our relationship to one another and to our work. But our focus every day is what's next, what's in the future. How do we honor what we've done, but how do we just move forward constantly? In terms of what we're doing, but also in terms of what we're covering. But at the same time, we love craft. We love culture. We love food. We love so many things that have incredibly incredibly deep historical context. And sometimes we need to provide that historical context. But it is about how do these practices move ahead into the future. So uh, when Evan talks about the future and focusing 95% on the future, it's not without being aware of the past and without acknowledging and respecting and celebrating the past and figuring, you know, it is very much in many cases about looking to the past and figuring out what to pull forward to the present and into the future. Well, you two are inspiring. This has been such a fortifying, gratifying fascinating, wonderful conversation. And I'm so glad I got to spend this time with you. And I hope it's just the beginning. Same. Us too. This was super fun. Thank you, Amy. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Josh and Evan, including some amazing pictures of them and a bonus Q&A, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you like Clever, there are a number of ways you can support us. Share Clever with your friends, leave us a five-star rating or a kind review, support our sponsors, or hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app so that our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and X. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com to make sure you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Mark Zurawinski, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows. It's rare that a month goes by where Evan doesn't suggest that we move back to Paris. (laughs)